This conference will now be recorded. Okay, top of the hour. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know there are folks that are coming in. Um, if you are not talking and you want to go on mute, that would be great. We're going to make this a little bit informal. Um, you can ask questions as we go along. And then our plan on this end is to give you about, we're going to try to keep it to a 30 minute overview. So we've got plenty of time to ask questions afterwards as well. And, um, you know, if we, if we wrap up a little early, that's okay. So Crystal McGuire, I'm executive director of the Aviation Technician Education Council and also manage Choose Aerospace, which is the organization that's driving the initiative we're talking about today. I'm joined here with two colleagues. I want to go ahead and introduce Karen Johnson, who's a sub Dr. Karen Johnson, who's associate professor at Southern Illinois University, um, also lead subject matter expert for the curriculum development project. So she is going to be giving you guys a demo of the content. Um, and then she's the one that you will go to if you're participating in the pilot or you use the product um, down the road. She would be the one that is going to be aggregating most of your feedback and leading that team. And then also Ryan Gertzen. Uh, Vice President of Workforce Development for AAR Corp, who is also Choose Aerospace President. Um, so he's going to be the color man today. I'm going to take you guys through a couple of slides and then Ryan, obviously, feel free to jump in um, as we go. So I mentioned, let me see if I can get my slides to work here. Uh, so just to kind of for I know we got a lot of folks on the phone that are new to this organization. Um, a lot are members, but just so that everybody kind of knows a little bit of an introduction about who we are. So ATEC is the trade association that represents aviation maintenance schools um, in the US. By and large, the majority of those programs have certificated aviation FAA certificated part 147 programs or 180 of those programs. Um, across the US and ATEC membership, we probably have around three quarters of those are members of ATEC. So Ryan had asked me to put this slide up because it just kind of gives you, there's a, on that link, there's a map of schools that have FAA certificates. So a lot of you already have, you know, partnerships with some of these certificated schools, but if you don't, it would be good to kind of know the lay of the land, you know, where, who in your area, maybe already has a maintenance program. So I mentioned the ones that have FAA certificates. There's obviously tons of schools out there with programs that aren't necessarily FAA certificated, you know, sheet metal programs or avionics programs. Those don't necessarily need to have uh, approval by the FAA to, to run that, to run that program. Um, a lot of those schools are also on the map. So it's just a good resource for you as you move forward and sort of get a better understanding of this community um, secondary education, so post-secondary education. So high schools haven't um, historically been incredibly involved with ATEC. We do have some folks that are on the roster. There are, I think, probably four or five, six high school programs in the U.S. that have a Part 147 certificate, um, but very much the minority um, in this group. So, um, and last February, February 2020, so like I said, ATEC sort of uh, represents these certificated programs. We do a lot of regulatory advocacy with the FAA since the schools, their programs are governed by the agency. Um, we do a lot of legislative advocacy. Um, we are working under a very old regulation, and so we've done a lot of work, you know, trying to renovate that rule. Um, we have also started looking at, we work a lot with um, employers of mechanics um, who are also very involved in the trade association. So airlines, regional airlines, repair stations, um, a lot of those folks are also on the phone today. It's very important to us that industry is heavily involved, right, in all of our initiatives because they're the ones ultimately hiring the students that we produce. So. We looked a lot at workforce development awareness campaigns, um, so decided that it would be best if we had a separate, um, it's a 501, Choose Aerospace is a 501c3, so charitable organization. Um, ATEC is also a nonprofit, um, but Choose Aerospace is a separate vehicle that is able to drive some of these educational initiatives. 
Um, so our very first initiative that we decided to pursue when the organization was incorporated right before the pandemic <laughs> came down was curriculum development. So and the reason we targeted this specific initiative, um, our schools are, so I mentioned the 180 certificated schools in the US, we know nationally those schools are only at about 50% capacity. Um, we do an annual pipeline report that comes out, which talks a lot about workforce development and needs versus demand. We thought the best way to impact um, the number of folks that were coming out of these programs in order to meet industry demand was to get more students coming into those programs. So the best way to do that, high school partnerships, um, our members, they have high school partnerships, but is severely underutilized. We survey our members. We know that um, you know a lot of them would like to see more, um, more, more in ways to their local um, high schools, but that they don't either have the resources or wherewithal or what have you to to get it done. So we thought, what better way to get those folks into our AMP programs is to develop sort of out of the box content curriculum that aligns with FAA certification standards um, to give those high school students um, ultimately credit into these AMP schools. So while our members mostly by and large are um, certificated programs, we also see there's obviously a big um, opportunity for those students to go directly into apprenticeship programs or um, certificate pathways through part 65 through employment, you know, at, at likely an MRO um, or business aviation. So while I, the, the idea was sort of born out of this um, concern for the trend that our schools, our certificated schools weren't getting enough butts in seats. Um, we also see this as a way to the curriculum project to feed other workforce development um, programs. The ultimate goal, and Ryan will tell you, is to get more folks into aviation careers. Um, and so this is one of the ways that we thought we might have the biggest impact um, is develop develop this content. Ryan, anything else you want to say about you know the initiative and how it was born out of the organization? No, I, I think he did a great job there. I would just say just to the group also that um, in 2018, the, there was a lot of workforce development in the FAA Reauthorization Act. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to read that act, uh, it's kind of kind of a good read, Section 625. And, and one of the they did a lot of things in that act, but, but uh, two things that in particular is um, they initiated through the Department of Transportation a Women in Aviation Task Force as well as a Youth in Aviation Task Force. And if you get a chance to, uh, for the group, if you get a chance to kind of research kind of who's on those committees and, and, the, and the tasking of the committees is to do exactly what Choose Aerospace is trying to do with this curriculum, is to really open up opportunities to youth uh, while they're they're still in high school and developing uh, programs like AOPA has done uh, on the pilot and, and UAV side. Um, and, and I think Choose Aerospace and, and, and being tied to, you know, the uh, to ATEC really makes the, the, the curriculum on the maintenance side a viable path uh, for, for youth to choose. I would also say that we're also looking at Expanding, um, and I'm like, expanding, okay, perfect. Expanding, um, obviously, aviation and the opportunity for aviation based curriculum to underrepresented populations. And we've been working through Choose Aerospace with a wide variety of organizations from YWCA to the Urban League. Uh, and others that, that this curriculum can also, also be used uh, to create that educational pathway in maintenance. So we're excited to have everyone on the call today and, and really look forward to working with you uh, throughout this pilot project, if you so choose, uh, to, uh, to really learn uh, about how, how to best deploy and ultimately um, create the curriculum that we, that we, we all did all are working towards. I would also say we do have a meeting on June 1st with the FAA. So as Crystal said, we're, we're very, very much engaged with the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, there's some, there's a couple of, uh, I wouldn't say barriers, but there are a couple of things that are different 
in the aviation maintenance world on the curriculum and regulatory side than there is on the pilot side. So we're trying to work through some of those things as well uh, and be, be ready to go in August um, uh, with the pilot. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Crystal. Thanks, Ryan. So really, really important to us whenever we incorporated Cheese Aerospace that it was a coalition. So we kind of saw ATEC as the common denominator, if you will, where education, our students go to every sector of aviation. So it was important to us that we had input from all representatives um, of, of the industry. So when we when we put together our advisory committee and the on our development team, um, we're working with Clemson, Clemson University. Um, Arcs Aviation is also an entity that's developing content that will be that will be um, integrated into the platform, which Karen will show you in a minute. Labor organizations, high school technical programs, current certificated programs, airlines, regional airlines. Um, it was important, like I said, that we had a coalition, and I think that's represented by the board of directors. So we have academia that is represented like I mentioned, labor, regional airlines. Um, Sean is uh, in leadership at the Federal Aviation Administration. So really important that we had our, our regulators um, involved as well. And then we are putting together, we're at the very beginning of putting together an advisory committee that will look at the content um, as it's developed through the summer. And again, was really important to us that we had a lot of industry input and that it wasn't you know, just commercial airlines or just MRO. Um, so uh, I haven't gotten permission to put all the company names up here, um, but just to kind of give you a sense um, of, of, you know, UAS to write all those different communities um, we want to get engaged. And so there is an action item at the end. If you know of an industry partner, you know, somebody that might be interested in volunteering to um, look at the content as we move along through the summer, that's also an opportunity. Um, Karen, I mentioned, is the lead SME on the project. Also just wanted to give you a behind the scenes look at those that are developing um, the platform that she's going to be going through here in a minute. Like I said, Clemson University Center for Workforce Development, they're taking the lead on the project. A lot of the content has already been developed um, previously. They get a lot of grant funding in order to develop some of this, some of this stuff. So we're sort of picking up um, a, a good, they had a good base, if you will, a place to start. Um, and some of our Part 147 schools had used the platform in the past. Um, Clemson responded to a request for proposal. Uh, I, I didn't mention, so we put out a request for proposal. So we've been going through a procurement process, if you will, for about a year um, and landed on Clemson and our um, aviation after we received, you know, I think nearly a dozen responses to an RFP. So um, Ryan and his team, the board, have put it together, put a lot, a lot of work and thought. Um, and we're still negotiating contracts. So I'm saying we're working with Clemson and ARCS, knowing that there's still some terms that we're going to have to figure out. And you'll see that as we get through some of the slides. We have still have a couple of unknowns or, you know, things that we're going to need to firm up before. Uh, we officially uh, deploy the pilot program in the fall. So just a quick overview of the curriculum and then I'll turn it over to Karen. Computer, it's computer-based content. So no equipment necessarily needed. I'll talk about equipment and hands-on projects that we're putting together as sort of a, a, an add-on, um, not necessarily required, but if you would like to incorporate some of that content, you you will have the opportunity to do so. Um, so high fidelity simulations, um, like I said, Karen will show you that in a minute. For those of you that are familiar with the regulatory framework, the Federal Aviation Administration uh, puts out issues certificates um, and they require that the candidates for these certificates have the knowledge and skill that set forth, forth an airman certification standard. So we're in a little bit of limbo period right now because for mechanics, the certification standard hasn't been officially published yet. Um, it's brand new on the pilot side. You may, if you're familiar with that side, you probably have seen airman certification standards that came out years ago. ATEC is very, very, very involved um, in developing the standards and encouraging <laughs> the agency to get them published. Um, there's a lot of reasons why they've been held up, which if you want to um, talk about it over a cocktail, I'm happy to give you the long, sad story. But 
But um, suffice it to say that we are using the draft certification standards. ATEC has the draft up on its website, and I put the link here in the PowerPoint um, deck for you so that you can kind of see this is what we're building the curriculum off of are these certification standards, which we know once published will be the standard that the FAA uses to certificate individuals to um, ensure that they've got the knowledge and skill needed to hold an FAA certificate. So the building block, if you will, and it's divided up into three parts, um, general airframe and power plant, just like the current part 147 is, we are building the curriculum on the general portion. So just the general portion of the airman certification standard. So if you wanna take a deep dive into the skill, knowledge and skill elements that this curriculum will cover, you can go to that draft standard um, and, it, and it will show you very clearly um, the elements that are covered. We're looking at um, 12 subjects and that is directly mirroring the subject areas that are um, set forth in the general portion of the ACS. We're approximating around 500 contact hours. Um, that's largely based on um, our part 147 schools that have general content and how they divide up the contact hours. We expect that will fluctuate depending on how the school utilizes the content. So we can talk about that a little bit too if you've got questions. Um, we're gonna be leaning on our pilot schools a lot to kind of give a better estimate of the contact hours, but that's that's our best, I wouldn't say guess. I mean, it's, it's not a total guess. We have some things to back it up, but we have broken it up on that curriculum page, which is linked at the bottom there, how much we estimate each course, which contact hours for, for each um, module. We're gonna do six modules available in the fall, and then the second six would be available, oh, Karen, I think it was December or January. So the idea would be that the first six, we would expect that a high school would put the first six out in the junior year and the second six out in the senior year, totally flexible, right? Once the content is available, the school or the program will be able to slice and dice it any way they want to. We have some suggestions of the order that you should do it, but it will be totally flexible, modular, you'll be able to pick and choose. But for purposes of the pilot, we'll have the first six done in August and then the second six done, Karen, I think it was January, isn't that our timeline? Right, um, ready for the spring, well, I would call it the spring semester start. Um, we, ATEC, um, we are in a unique position where we have that network of AMP schools, so um, are working on MOUs and those types of things with our 147 schools to offer opportunities for the high school students to matriculate into those programs. Obviously, if you're a high school with a local 147, you might work that out um, on your own, but just know that ATEC is there to sort of support. We, we want the high school student to be able to actually, you know, take something out of the program, be it credit um, towards an, uh, you know, higher ed, AMP certificate program, associate's degree, bachelor's, whatever um, that may be, and also coordinate um, opportunities for to direct to employment um, so like when Ryan said we were talking with workforce development programs such as the YMCA, um, those programs would be more working with, um, you know, employers at the end of that program that would be uh, for hiring those students coming out of those programs as well. Um, I mentioned the equipment. We do have a rough equipment list um, and some suggestions for projects. We would work with our pilot schools to develop hands-on projects that you might want to use in conjunction with the computer-based content, we would highly recommend that. Um, but knowing that one of the main barriers to implementing this content was the price associated with equipment and materials. So it was our intention to be able to simulate a lot of that in a computer-based environment. Um, that being said, certainly a lot of um, value in having the hands-on element. So we would provide, you know, rough equipment list projects. If you've got an employer or um, a 147 school that you can work with on these things, you know, we can help coordinate those as well. We hope to have a more um, sort of firm equipment list and project set. But again, looking to our pilot schools to kind of help us figure out what exactly those look like um, through the first year. Uh, and instructor requirements, which we know is another barrier. Um, we have put out 
Uh, as of right now, largely relying on our high schools, we know you have your own qualifications for your instructors, CTE, depending on the state requirements and all that. We do have recommendations, and that would be making sure that your instructor has the knowledge and skill, you know, outlined in those in that ACS to ensure that they can, you know, project it onto their students. But again, something that we'll be looking at the pilot schools to kind of firm up. But there is some uh, some language on that landing page talking about instructor requirements the pilot's going to be free to schools so we're looking for 20 schools 500 students um, to participate in the pilot and it would be free to those for the first year um, after that our agreements with our content developers do um, include licensing agreements so unfortunately we can't make it completely free for you even though we would love to do it um, so we will be working, you know, helping you guys through funding opportunities through employers and grant programs and those sorts of things. Um, and I know that a lot of you, you know, have your own funding resources, depending on the district and how it's set up and all that. So moving forward again, we're finalizing contracts right now with our partners, um, but we it's going to be under 200 bucks a student and we'll let you know exactly what that price point is once um, those negotiations are finished. Um, Karen, I have one more slide, but I think it's a good time maybe to do the demo part. Okay, um, let me share my screen. Share. Okay, is that showing up? Yep. Okay, so this is the landing page that you would come to. Um, and it gives a little bit of information about the program. You can scroll through and, and read some of that on your own. Um, once you have uh, a registered login, you can log in and your uh, courses will pop up here on your My Courses page. So as Crystal said right now, the only course that we have ready as it was our proof of concept piece was fluid lines and fittings, but you would have perhaps all six during um, the first fall semester and then all 12, if you're gonna continue on for the year, all of those would be listed here. Once you go into the course, um, here we go, you'll be able to see all the modules um, that are available. And then each one of these is a drop down. and inside the module, you can even have all the lessons drop down. So um, this kind of outline page is really nice because you can get a feel for the entire course without having to kind of tab through everything. Uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a peek into what some of these, uh, what some of the content look like while you're in here. So we try to reach, um, or try to use multiple different modalities. So we have some text-based uh, pages. We have some really nice interactive images um, that students will be able to uh, see and understand a little bit better what they're reading in the text. Um, here's some more text. We also have um, kind of some click-through processes, so if I can read and talk at the same time, drag the hose up, and then the next instruction is to bring down um, the hacksaw. So you can, some of these are in here as well, these interactive processes that students can walk through after they've read, you know, that content-based knowledge. And then we even have some even, um, Clemson made some even more dynamic simulations. I would probably refer to these as simulations where the other ones were more um, an interactive and it's going to take a minute now to load up, of course, now that we're here and watching. <laughs> here we go. Um, so these are Clemson simulations that they've designed. And again, this is the fluid lines and fittings module. So you can kind of step through these. Um, it gives you some information, some instructions at the bottom. Then you can step through step by step. Um, and get uh, you know that simulated experience of actually um, going through and, and fabricating fluid lines, of course, and then there will be obviously other ones, uh, other simulations in the different modules that you went through. Um, so the other thing I wanted to show you while we're in here, let me get back out here. All of these um, lessons also have activities interspersed throughout and activities um, can include anything from multiple choice questions uh, to maybe even some short answer critical thinking type um, activities. But a lot of these we've tried to make them align with what we know um, might get asked during like orals and practicals or even on the written. And then at the very end of the course, you're going to have this course exam. Um, where it gets a little bit more 
um, in depth on the questions and overall for the whole module. So that's it in a nutshell. I'm happy to answer any other questions you may have about it, but I'll pass it back to Crystal, unless there's something else you want me to show. I think that gives a good feel, Ryan. Yeah, I was just going to jump in, and I think uh, I we think we had somebody give a question here on Michael from Cape Cod on CBT versus instructor-led, and I think that's a really good, you know, when we built this and, and we were thinking about this concept, we didn't think about the fact that COVID would completely change the world and this, this idea of completely remote learning uh, wasn't, you know, initially thought about, right? And And so... What we wanted to create when we when we did this was we, we we recognized one the cost barriers of trying to bring in and you know buy an airplane have a hangar develop you know buy jacks and all these things that you have to do in order to do the fa general curriculum when when we looked at it though we we wanted to also make sure that we provided the maximum flexibility to each individual school but ensuring that the content was all the same so how you delivered it, whether it was an instructor in a classroom, whether it was a flipped educational model where you, you tell the student, tomorrow we're gonna to be talking about this, I want you to review it tonight, and then we're gonna come in and do test questions or we're gonna figure out what you didn't learn. Um, we really wanted to provide that kind of flexibility to you, the educational institution, that best fits your schools and, and how you wanna do it. Um, so. So I think, you know, it's, it, it's, you know, one of the things that Karen didn't show is that every, every, um, every lesson also has an A&P instructor that has videotaped the lesson. So he, there's an A&P instructor talking through the lesson um, and as well in each of these modules. So, so I think there's, uh, you know, we, we tried to, you know, create all the different educational modalities we could while at the same time making sure that we had the flexibility to each individual school. So um, Karen, I'll maybe turn that over to you if I, I think I answered that right, I, I think. Yeah, I think so. Let me, let me turn the mute sure. on here. Forward. There we go. So yeah, as Ryan said, there, all of the content um, in the in each of the courses has obviously been put together by a 147 instructor. This is Carl Washburn. He was actually the lead SME on this project when it started a couple of years back with Clemson. So every one of the courses has a video lecture within each lesson. And um, this is this is just an example of one of them. And 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 most of the modules, let's see if I can get back out here, most of the modules will start off with um, a video lecture like this right here. You can see video lecture in 2.1. Um, oh, well, that one doesn't, of course, but that one has more interactivity. So um, there is an instructor kind of uh, right at the beginning, there's going to be an instructor led lecture, and that instructor is a 147 instructor. And then, of course, your high school instructors can, again, as Ryan said, kind of piece part out the lessons and the modules when, within each course. Of course, We've got them laid out in what we feel like is the proper order of instruction, but every school is different and every teacher is different and their classroom is different. So you have the ability to go in there and 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 use it in whatever order you feel fits best for, for your situation. It can be a, you know, in completely instructor led where your instructor is, you know, we were, there's all kinds of ways you could use it. And again, kind of leaning on our pilot schools to, do it different ways so that we can maybe make recommendations on how it's used but you know maybe you have an instructor who is well versed they can go through the content and then assign you know the online portions as homework um use it there's going to be a different back end for the instructor to use when it comes to assessments and those sorts of stuff which leads me um to the last slide and then we'll open it up um, we do have some plans for, can you guys see that? Yep. Um, deployment support. So professional development for the instructors. Our plan is to have a series in July. So the timeline is we would get our pilot school applications and by June 15th, 
we would finalize our slate of pilot schools, like I said, up to 500 users. However, that breaks up with the number of schools um, and, and a good cross section, right? Different geographics and um, those with partners of 147s or industry. So we wanna get a good cross section of the potential users. Um, and then in July, we would do a series of professional development series online, a series of, a series of professional development online where we would go through the platform, um, let Clemson get the instructors trained up on the, on the platform. Um, also talk about the partnership programs. Again, if you guys want to do hands-on elements, you need some resources from a local school that you don't already have introductions, right? I mean, ATEC can kind of make all of those, those introductions for you as well, putting together how to put together a lab, you know, a hands-on project. Um, and then also talking about um, career pathways, maybe we get the counselors involved in July to talk about here are the opportunities available to the student once they get this program under their belt. You know, here are the schools that offer credit. Here are, um, you know, some direct to employment opportunities. Those sorts of things. Thank you for calling Aviation Institute of Maintenance. Someone will be with you soon. Through our training and connections in different industries, we want you to succeed and land a career that you'll excel in. Who is it? The Aviation Maintenance Technician Program. Mute everyone. There you go. No, I got it. I, they flash when they're talking, so I can find them. Um, so again, like we'll kind of firm that up in July, but it's not our intention to just throw the platform in your lap and say, okay, here it is, right? We'll do several things in July to get everybody um, up and running. Um, so, like I said, the application is on that web page. I put it in the email. I'll also put a recorded version of this um, briefing on that page so that it's sort of a one-stop shop for all the resources you might need. Um, we'll give you 30 days if you want to make application, but obviously the sooner the better. We'll, I hate to say we're going to do first come, first serve, but the sooner we're able to get the schools um, lined up for the pilot, the better we'll be, you know, the more time we'll have to get it to get everybody up and running i mentioned the advisory committee and then feel free to share like if you've got other programs you're you're a secondary school here and you know of other high schools that might be interested um, feel free to forward on the information so ryan anything else you want to say before we open it up nope i'll i think we'll open it up for questions Um, okay, on the cost. So, Michael, thanks for the question. Uh, so, we are, so Choose Aerospace, let me kind of explain, that is sort of the whole, we're kind of, I'm not going to call us the marketing arm, right, but we're the network. <laughs> we know, in the, you know, we have the industry folks, we have the technical st school folks, and we know the need, right? So, we were going looking for a solution to the need. So, we went out and procured vendors that would help us develop this content um, to meet the specifications that we had. So, Unfortunately, we didn't have the resources, we choose aerospace, brand new entity, to make the content ourselves, right? As you guys know, who maybe tried to do this, it's very expensive. <laughs> so we ultimately had to do a licensing agreement. So those of you that use AOPA know that that content is free. AOPA developed the content themselves and they did it over the course of a few years, right? So we're taking a little bit different approach. We want it done right out the bat. <laughs> we didn't want to wait around to develop it and we didn't necessarily have the funds. Um, ATEC is me and one other admin, right? I mean, we're volunteer led. Um, so we just didn't have the resources that an organization like AOPA had. So that's why there's a cost associated with this. And it's also a little different, right? I mean, it's computer-based, um, high simulations. I mean, it, it costs a good chunk of change for Clemson to even get it off the ground. So that's why there are licensing agreements associated with it. And we have a couple of um, entities that Choose Aerospace is working with to get the licenses. So um, still working out, like I said, the terms for those contracts. Um, but we, we thought, based on our conversations with schools over the last year, we were trying to figure out what is the price point, right? Like, how do we balance the content? Because we wanted good content with what we thought schools could afford. And we came up with the number 180. 
however inaccurate um, it was. So that's why we're working really hard with our vendors to try to get the user fee under 200 bucks a user, and it'll be for an annual license. So it would be if you if you use the content over two years, it would be 200 thereabouts per user for the first year, and then another for the second year not to include the pilot. So the pilot is gonna be um, free and open and that's because in payment, you guys are gonna give us feedback on the content. Um, and that would be for the first year. If you decided to take it for the second year, our agreement with the, the vendors right now is first year open, that free for the first year, but you would pick up the user fees in the second year. Ryan, did I get all that right? That's correct. And, and I think one of the things that you know, choose aerospace being a nonprofit organization. One of the things we're trying to do is, is you know, work with industry partners. AAR is is my employer. I, I think the I, the ability for us, um, we're pretty excited at AAR to be able to 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 in essence sponsor schools. So let's say we sponsor ten schools, we pay, which is in essence your user license fee for these ten, you know, for the the students within those schools. So we're also going to be working, you know, diligently um, throughout this pilot project year to really work with our industry partners to bring them together also in supporting, um, you know, um, you guys after the pilot is over and and of course, growing, growing the content. I mean, I, I'm, I know there's a little over north of 16,000 high schools in, in the United States. It'd be awesome if we were in 10,000 of them. I, I tell Crystal, if we were just in 10,000 high schools, we wouldn't have a flow problem like we do today with people choosing aviation. And so I, I think, you know, as we, you know, you are, each of you on the phone are, are very, you know, integral to growing the aviation technician pipeline. And, and I think that as we work together, we're going to create a curriculum like AOPA has done and proven, uh, they got over 8,000 students that are that are taking aviation-based curriculum in high school. And I think, you know, knowing that the Choose Aerospace curriculum is 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 obviously very structured with high fidelity content and all the stuff that it has, we did so because we we had to in order to meet the FAA regulatory requirements um, of Part 147. So. Um, you know, that being said, I, you know, we did some research also in user fees and we understand um, some of our, I'll just say this, I mean, some of our, um, um, in our RFP, we, we got one company that we was willing, I think Crystal, they were going to spend 20 million to do what we asked them to do. And so <laughs> that was clearly above and beyond what was, uh, what we could afford clearly, but this is, we, we tried to strike that you know, as Crystal said, that happy medium between being able to really truly simulate, you know, workforce-based tasks, um, you know, to meet 147 requirements. So, yep. Um, so Eric, really good question. And Ryan briefly touched on it about the testing for the general. So if you're familiar with the FAA regulatory framework, then you'll know that you can take the FAA general. There's three tests, right, to get ready. I'm going to genericize this. There's a lot of tests that you have to take to be an FAA certificate mechanic. And one of them is the general written test, which a lot of a lot of times if you're in a Part 147 school, Eric, I'm going to mute you just for a second because there's a little bit of feedback. Um, and then I'll, I'll let you come back. Um, if you're a part 147 school, oftentimes you'll allow your students, you'll get an exemption from the rule that will allow your students to take that test a little bit earlier in their training cycle. Very much similar on the pilot side, right? You can take your written test after you take ground schools or, or what have you. It's not the same on the mechanic side. And so we, um, if you want to see the memo, I'm happy to share it, but we've been working with the FAA for a few months now, um, and we actually have a meeting on June 1st with leadership at the FAA, because everybody, I think, is in agreement that being able to take the general written test for a high school student that completes the FAA general written test, which doesn't get you any sort of certificate, right? It'll get you a report saying that you passed the general written test, which is the test that tests the knowledge elements that are going to be covered in this curriculum. Um, I think everybody's in agreement that it would be great for those students to have that um, and put them on the path towards certification. Um, there are time timelines, right, Eric, we probably are familiar with where you've got to 
finish your first rating within X number of months afterwards. Um, but we're working really, really hard with the FAA to find a way to make this happen. So we can't say for certain that your students are going to be able to take the FAA written test at the end of this curriculum, but that is certainly our intention. And we've got the right folks from the FAA um, on the call to to try to hammer this out. And we've we've made a couple of suggestions, a couple of pathways that that we could make this happen. Um, so we think it's viable. We think there's a good shot. And um, so TBD, Eric, you can unmute yourself now if you want to follow up on that. Hey, Crystal, Crystal Ryan, could you answer uh, the, with in respect to high school kids? I mean, a lot of my uh, well, not, I won't say a majority of my, my my kids are 18 by the time they graduate. But is the uh, the requirement to take the test still 18? Um, yeah, I would assume it's 18 to be an, a licensed technician. Right. So no, you should be a no. you can take your okay. test early. That's, that. that's that because I know yeah. I know it's you had to be 18 to be an A and P a total A and P right. to be certified. But I wasn't right. sure about that general on the 18. So right, I, I would I would also God I was thinking I would also say I mean clearly this test and the and the FAA understands the importance of being able to allow you guys to have your students test. The FAA clearly believes that it is a barrier to getting folks into the aviation maintenance career path because you can, there's no reason that 107 uh, students that are doing the, the UAV test or, or pi private pilots are doing the pilot test can test <laughs> and somehow we're, we're preventing maintenance. Um, and so I, you know, as Crystal said, I, I mean, there is, there is, we, we are, we are working very, very hard to make sure this happens. I think there is a fallback position in the fact that there are so many aviation maintenance schools in the country. Uh, being able to, to hopefully be able to partner with one of them through this curriculum is, is also another opportunity for us, um, which is kind of what happens today, right? High schoolers today go, you know, go take take the curriculum in high school, they then transfer into one of the AMP schools, they take their general exam because the FAA school has the exemption that allows you to break the regulation because there are 147 schools. So, so the, the, the more to come on that, as Crystal said, but we believe that that is instrumental in, in helping, especially the high schools, show that this leads to an industry recognized credential uh, after at the end. So we're working, um, working on that as well. I would also say, Bill, it looks like, is, is this a one or two year program? It's really up to you. Um, I, I think the earlier we can get, um, you know, if we're talking the junior year, right, you're talking to freshmen and sophomores that, that are thinking about matriculating into an aviation pathway, um, but you can do it all in one year um, if, if you so chose. So I think the only thing we were looking at for the pilot was Knowing that we were going to have just the first six modules ready by August, we didn't we didn't want to put undue pressure uh, potentially on getting the rest of the six done. Uh, but but more than likely they'll. I, knowing Karen and the team and what they're doing, I, I have no doubt that all 12 will be ready in January uh, because we do have some other organizations that have expressed interest in wanting to run all 12 in a kind of 16 week module so instead of looking at it a year based we're going to look at it over the next 16 weeks the students will be in class six hours a day um and and, and being able to deploy it that way as well all right okay because I, I mean you're aware I, I i we work with commemorative air force and our juniors and seniors go up there essentially it's a double block class so we're there for what two hours or two and a half hours every other day um so it makes it you know and and Nancy and those guys are more than willing to be part of this and help out as well. So I have uh, an IA and a few other AMP, AMPs up there that are more than happy to help out as well. So it's it's kind of, that's that, that was the question because we can get it, then the seniors next, because as you're aware, I mean, we're rebuilding a J3 right now and the seniors are. So it's um, to get the juniors ahead of the game and then get them into that. Um, in their senior year and be part of it, continue on from there. 
as well as internships, because we're, uh, you know, Dabisky's really big on internships. And if I could get this, I could get a lot more internships, paid internships with some of the industry people in the neighborhood, so. Absolutely, Kelly, if you could, Kelly, can you explain the Oregon requirement? I, I just want to make sure I understand what you uh, said there. Well, I'm also going to rely on Sherry Fisher, who's here to maybe explain a little bit further. But um, part of the Oregon Student Privacy Agreement, it's, it's a law, is that we have to have any online curriculum that students sign into or create an account that they don't share information or student information. And we have a privacy agreement that all entities need to agree by and sign and then um, for us to be able to use curriculum. Okay. Okay. Yeah, let's get some more information on that, Kelly. And I imagine that could be some sort of like wrap around something through the through the platform. On the data side, right? You kind of bring up another point. Um, it is it's important it's important to choose aerospace that we get some data from this, especially when it comes to where the students go when they're done. So impact, right? Are we we think this is going to make an impact in the pipeline? Does it actually make an impact? So. We don't know exactly um, what those data points look like yet. We'll be working on that over the summer as well. It certainly wouldn't include specific student information, um, but there would be some data that we um, would be asking the schools to provide. So we'd certainly work with our pilot schools to know, you know what it is that they can provide versus not. And then we also have partners um, like Pathways to Aviation, who's also on the advisory committee, who does like wraparound. I know a lot of your schools, right, have career advisors and those sorts of things for the students. We also have those resources through our partners. And so um, Choose Aerospace is looking to partner with folks like Pathways to Aviation, who provide sort of a bridge between the content and ultimate employment, you know, resume prep and all the introductions to industry and all those sorts of things. So um, it, we're hoping to be able to leverage those relationships again, to be able to follow the student um, where they go. So we know what kind of impact that we're making. Um, so that's data, you know, is, is part of this for sure on the industry side and also to help with funding, right? I mean, we would love to get a grant that pays for the content for everybody for the next five years. <laughs> um, but the only way we'll be able to do something like that is to is to see, um, you know, the impact that it's having, so. Can I can I ask a few questions on, on my topic? Yeah. Okay, so I'm a, I'm a aviation maintenance high school. Um, I'm articulated with the local community college that does have a current uh, 147 program. So I feed into them. So if uh, Mike says that we can, the kids can take the test early, but they can't get their certificate, that makes perfect sense. So would I be taking students away or is, is the curriculum on itself uh, warrant enough to, to take the, the, the general test or do you have to be a satellite? And how would that impact my articulation agreement with the local college? So if that I'm assuming, comes I'm assuming yeah. if, if my kids took the journal with me, they would feed right into the local college for their airframe and uh, power plant. That's right. That's right. And so that's how it would work with the school. So if you if they were going directly into a part 147 school, they could the student could also do that. Right. We wouldn't need to give them the test maybe right on a high school because like Ryan said, they could go, they could matriculate. That school probably has an exemption. Almost all of them do to allow that student to test as soon as they enroll. Aviation Institute of Maintenance would do that, for example. Um, it's So the reason for the test is our understanding is that it's also great for a high school to have that certificate opportunity at the end of a program for funding or whatever, what have you. And then also folks like Ryan at AA Corp, you know, that has some value. If that student comes out of high school and decides to go and, you know, work at a repair station, maybe Ryan, you can talk about that a little bit, what kind of value that has for you as an employer, maybe not so much, you know, for a Delta, um, but for an AAR where that student could uh, get their certificate through part 65. So they've done the general, they have a baseline knowledge, they still need to have the 30 months before they can get their certificate. Um, but, you know, I think there are a lot of reasons why it's important. Um, that might not be you know, matriculation agreements and um, the impact that it has on that, you wouldn't have to test them, right? If they were had the opportunity to test later. No, but I just want to know if the training's valid. If I give them the training, is it valid? And then 
can, uh, does it qualify them to take the test or do I have to be considered a satellite um, organization in order for that? I don't want to go through, I don't want the students to go through the training and then when it, thinking that they're ready, then they got to go to the JC and take two more years or, you know, four more general classes or two more general classes. Just wait a minute, we already did all this. So, I mean, I, what validates the, the program? Is it the program itself or do I have to be a satellite uh, facility? So Ryan, you can take a seat, but the, you wouldn't have to be a, so if the FAA does, we don't know yet because the FAA hasn't told, <laughs> told us we can do this. So that is the request, right, to the FAA is that your students be able to take the general test when you're done, which yes, would help validate it. The, or, the part or, 147 school would have to, it wouldn't just take the test to validate it, right? It would also look at the content. So we would have the content available to the 147 schools who are part of this, right? A lot of representatives on the call today to know that, hey, here's the content that you're offered through Choose Aerospace. Here's how it aligns with my program. And this is the credit that I would give you, right? I'm going to validate it myself because I'm going to look at the training from a Part 147 perspective. And by the way, you also have a completed general test, which is awesome. It sort of helps validate what I've already yeah. said. Exactly. So, 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 Eric, the, let's just use Joel for example. Joel English. They have high school programs for the Aviation Institute of Maintenance. The high school program is based upon their current 147 curriculum. What they're going to do is they're going to take that away and put Choose Aerospace's curriculum into those high schools where they already have all these partnerships already set up. So the idea is, is Joel knows what the curriculum is he knows the content he knows all the educational outcomes and he knows that the students you know if it all sets up right will be able to take the test at the end of of the high school program and then at the time at the time they then move into the aviation institute of maintenance they would then just transfer those credits give them credit for the the general curriculum and they would start at airframe or power plant depending upon which track they're on so so as Crystal said, the whole point of this is to, to not have you have to be an FAA certificated entity or, or even tied to one for that matter, right? We want to be able to stand alone like all these other aviation programs can except maintenance um, and, and the FAA is seeing that. So I think it's a great, great point and, and you're absolutely correct. We do, we, it would be insane, right, for your, you to do this curriculum and then the, the 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 college don't accept the credits and then force them to redo all all the credits over again. That that's not the way this is going to work because as Crystal said, we're working closely with the FAA to be able to do this for the certification process. And once that uh, not the certification, but but for recognition of being able to test at the end and knowing, like Karen said, 147.31 already allows you to do this within the current regulation framework, um, um, we would expect the students to roll right into the airframe and power plant side of the curriculum, just as you said. Brian, Brian may I make a comment? Um, this is Paula Keedy with the Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission, and I have been working with uh, an Oklahoma high school who's in year four of the AOPA uh, field test process. I think this field test process is critical uh, to making sure because we the Ada High School in Oklahoma now has students who are taking the written uh, pilots exam and we have had to look at and talk to AOPA during this field test process to ensure that those students are truly ready to take that written test and to tweak and to make changes and to be willing in that pilot process to really look at how prepared the students are to take that written exam and then to move on. So I think I just wanted to comment that I think that the field test part of this will be critical for us to be able to know are they ready to for that certification and to move on. Yep, totally agree. I do also think Paula if, if I could talk for those of you. I, I think maybe many of you use AOPA's curriculum, and and I think that you know understand. You know, we, we've we've we understand their curriculum and how it came about. And I think the process that we're using with Clemson, with the 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 subject matter experts that Karen and the and are, are working with, is creating a 
you know, it, there's not as much leeway, right, in the curriculum, right? It's, it's forcing you to do an educational model this way, always, right? Uh, from right. the standpoint of at least the content. AOPA has a little bit more free flowing in their curriculum because it's not as regulated, right? It, it doesn't, it, it's not True. some of the differences between between this and, and this curriculum versus versus AOPA. Not that, not that one is better than the other. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, um, and, I, and I think you're right, Paula, at the end, you know, whether you choose to go the, the junior year or whether you choose to have all your seniors take this curriculum, you know, at the end of either one, that those educate being able to take that test should have a validation of knowledge uh, that we should be looking at, you know, in years three, four, you know, just like you said, uh, through the through the through the, the the curriculum. Thank you. Any other questions? Ryan, Karen, any parting thoughts? Well, I would just say, I, I, I think great questions. I know a whole bunch more are gonna come up. And, and I think, uh, you know, as we look at, um, you know, as we look to the future and and knowing knowing what I'm already experiencing, I know Bill, Bill Smith from Delta is on here uh, also, you know, I, of course, crisis is already returning way quicker than I think most people realize. <laughs> and, and this project, uh, in my mind, at least from an AA, if I put my AAR hat on, it is absolutely critical that we grow the number of high schoolers that are seeing aviation as a viable career path. We enhance the partnerships between high schools and these 147 programs that exist, as well as high schools and industry. Because I'll be honest, I can take a student right out of your high school through my uh, apprenticeship program and make them a certificated technician in 18 months for an airframe 30 and then we would partner with a school because we don't do enough work for the for the power plant side but i can get them certificated right out of high school so so i think uh being able to work with this group uh and being able to really uh, grow the pipeline statistically because unfortunately and I think Crystal you brought it up when we started talking about student privacy and we're, we're we're talking a lot about this in the youth and aviation task force we're doing a terrible job in aviation I'm just going to say it we, we we do all kinds of great things but yet we're we, we can't measure any of it right you you ask you ask how many AOPA graduates of the 8,000 went on to aviation schools and nobody has any idea. You ask, you know, Young Eagles program, of the of the million people that went through your flying program, how many of them actually went into aviation? They can't answer that question either. And and we, we have got to start connecting all these dots so that we get the high schools, the colleges, the industry, the jobs all aligned together uh, so that we can truly have these AMP schools, which right now are operating at half capacity. So we have the capacity, we just don't have the students going to these schools. And so I, I, I really, you know, really to work with this team, because um, uh, that's what it's going to be. It's going to be a team effort uh, to make this happen. And, and I appreciate everybody's willingness to participate. So uh, Crystal, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, uh, I had one thing to add to what Ryan said about apprenticeship. If I get it, I'm Dave Bowen from Aviation Technical Services. We run uh, apprenticeships for airframe mechanic at Kansas City and at Ever Washington. If I get a kid out of high school, stuns curriculum, I can grant him 400 hours towards his apprenticeship. I have the ability to do that also. He'll still have to do his 18 months for the FA for Part 65. <clears throat> grant him that time and recognize his efforts. Right. Yeah. You know, too, Ryan, I, I mean, we've talked about this, too, around here. I mean, my biggest problem with getting internships in this area is the fact that, number one, I, I mean, I'm up for, for Paula. I'm a part of the AOPA uh, program as well. <clears throat> I've been a part of it from the start. But um, the biggest problem I've, I've had with the AOPA program and not the program itself, but 
out there is that what you're doing is you're making you're you're getting bringing a kid up into the private pilot and that's it but most especially here in texas mm -hmm. they say private pilot well that doesn't make them any money when they get out of school and there's still a long way to go before they start making money and they have to go on from there um and Dubisky and a lot of other schools are about internships and things like that. And to me, this is the best path. I have probably more kids going towards the maintenance side than I do the pilot side, even though they've gone through the curriculum. My seniors, I have more, I have more seniors going through into the maintenance world than to the pilot side. So, you know, for me, it's it's a little bit more of a thing. I I, I love the AOPO program. It has, as a friend of mine down in Florida says, a lot of fluff, but it has to because it's a four-year program for something that I can teach in six months in a normal flight school. So, you know, it's it makes it makes it interesting. <laughs> All right, Crystal, I got to go, but thank you. Crystal, hey, Chris, Crystal Eddie. Yeah. Hey, what's Hi, the next step for these schools that are interested in this uh, pilot program? How do you want to contact you and what's your time frame? Yep. Yep, so there is an application up on that website that we put in the chat. So if you are really, if you're interested and you're ready to go, fill that out and we'll get you a spot on the pilot. So that would be due by June 15th. If you want some more information, we can connect you with Karen to do more demo. We can probably even get you a login for that fluid lines and fittings proof of concept um, if you want to dig around any more. So, I, so you have 30 days, I guess, right? To do all the fact gathering. <laughs> <laughs> that we need to do um, and then around June 15th is where we need to really firm up the list and um, get deployment started. Good. One, qu one question related. Okay, so the, the objective is to funnel from high school to, to junior college and then into the workforce. Um, I'm having a, a big issue getting interns set up because most of my kids are under 18 and you know, according to liability and laws and, you know, FAA, federal laws that are um, applying to these facilities. I, is there a workaround on that? Does the district buy the, the liability? Does does the company have options to uh, be flexible about getting kids that are under 18 into these intern programs? Because orally or verbally, they say, you know what, I, I'd love to do interns with you. I'd love to open it up for four to six of your high school kids to come out for the summer and work for four to six weeks. But there again, the liability issue and insurance and under 18 throws a wrench in it. So I'm, I go to advisory meetings, but nobody's, that issue is never always brought up, but never resolved. So I don't know any, any help from the field would, would be great. Hey, uh, Eddie, uh, William, Bill Irvin over here. I'm down in Dallas. Um, we've, we've solved that problem through i mean the school has a, a liability policy in this place too but the state of texas state of texas has has some issues as well uh with it and they do um they they help a little bit the uh, texas education association stuff like that but i mean for the most part if they're under 18 we do have a a liability policy. We have kids going, I mean, not just my program, but uh, most of the transportation programs, most of the CTE programs here, all have internships throughout the Dallas Metroplex. I mean, we're probably one of the few schools that do, but we we have it and it and it's pushed pretty hard. But um, that's that's how we get around it is we have our own policy plus uh, plus agreements with the companies and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, thanks, Eric, for the question. If Dave or Ryan were on, they might be able to speak to that a little bit more. I think probably what we could do is, you know, a best practices. It's going to vary so much state to state, district yeah. to district. Um, but if we were able to put in place some best practices or examples on what you could do, you know, with the students aren't quite 18, um, or for, um, you know, the, the internship folk, the ones that are actually putting together the apprenticeship or the internship. I'd be interested to hear from Dave at ATS, you know, what they do with their apprenticeship model. Cause I, my understanding is they take in high school students and I don't know if they wait until they're 18 or they can do it before, but the good thing is we have the resources, you know, here and the folks I, at the table, I think that could help us work through some of that. Thanks for the comment.
All right, I'm going to put this, like I said, the recorded version up. Reach out to me, Ryan or Karen, if you guys have questions, um, and we'll probably be sending out a few more notes coming up to June 15th. But other than that, um, you know, balls in your guys' court. Come to us if you want some more information on how to get how to get situated and, and up and running for the fall. So thanks very much, everybody. Appreciate your time. Oh, hey, Crystal. Yes, sir. Hey, do you, uh, the, the link for that gap, um, the gap paper you guys were talking about on one of your other things, um, is that on the backside of the uh, website or is that is that accessible by those of us who <laughs> haven't yet is become this the members? General, is this the general testing thing? Oh, the gap yeah. analysis? The general the testing analysis? memo? Right. So, so there's two things. There's the general testing memo that we're working with the FAA on. I'm happy to share that. I'll send it around um, in a link in an email. And then the second thing, there is a gap analysis from the ACS to the 147. Right. Um, is that what you're talking about? That's free yeah. on the website too, and I can I can send that over. It's, yeah, if you could. Yeah, if you would, please. Because yeah. um, I have, I, I mean, Texas, the TEKS here in Texas for aviation, the only TEKS we have here in Texas, the education, knowledge, and skills and stuff is is maintenance based. Okay. It's, it's so, I mean, I can relate a lot of the stuff from the AOPA program to maintenance because it has to deal with airframes and all that kind of stuff. It, it, it crosses over, but the point is, yeah. is that it's all, so I need to find out in a TEKS what, how it correlates to the program as well. So, so that way I can go to my people and say, Hey, this is, this works. Gotcha. Yeah. So what we did, so our current 147 schools are working under, a, you know, the current rule and they're going to be transitioning to this airman certification standard. So we sure. downloaded all the knowledge and skill elements from the ACS for them to be able to do cross reference with their current curriculum. So I can see how that might be valuable. You would just look at the general elements um, yeah. instead of the airframe and the power plant. So yeah, I can send that over to you. Yeah. And that right. you would, you, it's in Excel. So you can just kind of identify, you know, where the elements are located. Okay, great. Cool. All right. Hi, Chris. It's good to see your face. <laughs> it is, yeah. Nice to see you in person as well. Thank you guys so much yeah. for your time. Yeah, it was fun.